Good morning. This is Jim Colburn of Commodity Research Group. I'm with Andy LeBeau, also of Commodity Research Group, and we're here with another edition of Energy Markets. To learn more about us, you can check out our website, commodityresearchgroup.com, where we post our podcast and blog. We would like to thank our friends at EKT Interactive Oil and Gas Training for hosting this podcast. Check out their newsletters, podcasts, and learning modules at ektinteractive.com. This podcast should be construed as market commentary, merely observing economic, political, and market conditions, and is not intended to refer to or endorse any particular trading system, strategy, or recommendation. We are not responsible for trading decisions taken by anyone. Information is not guaranteed to be accurate. This is not an offer to buy or sell any derivative. Today is January 15th. And Andy, this is the first podcast of the year. Good morning. Good morning. And I I thought, uh, once again, we have a lot of moving parts, but I I thought I would just do a quick summary of 2019 from an option volatility perspective, and that'll lead us right into uh, today's you know, focus on geopolitical events. So with that, I just want to say when, when um, we came into 2019, we hit, we didn't know it at the time, but we hit the high volatility of the year at 53. And that was because we, we were coming off a really uh, bear market. Uh, we made a low of Dece- at December 24th, trading in the 40s. And we had come down from uh, in the 70s from October. And uh, we bottomed and then started rallying up from there. The low vol was made on April 5th at 22.2. It's a, you know, that's a huge move. And then September was another, the next big vol move was the Saudi, uh, the bombing of the Saudi oil fields. And we got up to 46.4. And I thought that was interesting because we couldn't, you would think anytime there was a bombing of a Saudi oil installation, that would be the high vol of the year, maybe of the decade. Uh, but it wasn't. And uh, we traded lower from there, volatility wise. And um, the, we are now, the, the we got down to like 22% in December during the holidays. And then of course, with the killing of uh, General uh, Suleiman, and then the price, we had a six, $6.50 range in early uh, January, where the, the vol moved up to 29.4. So part of it, obviously is is the taking out of the general and part of it was the Iraqi response but we got up to 29.4 below the long term average which is around 327 applied volatility so it wasn't a huge vol event and um we're around 26% now so that kind of leads us into the geopolitical issues still driving this market maybe short term, but they're still hanging in the background. Why don't, we, why don't we start out with comments on Iran and their response? And what do you think uh, we do going forward? Well, Iranian production has obviously come off very sharply from uh, pre-sanctions to post-sanctions. They were producing at around three point three pre-sanctions and they're now at 2.0, 2 million barrels a day post-sanctions. Now, the Trump administration had uh, tried to get them to zero. They've they've done a good job um, in in terms of crude because crude has come down to about 200,000 barrels a day of exports from uh, something like 1.2 to 1.5. Uh, but they're still uh, ex- exporting products. Product exports are um, probably like three to 400,000 barrels a day, which is, is maybe even higher than that, which is helping to, to a certain extent, fund the regime. Now, you know, they've obviously, they're having, because their crude exports are, are down so hard, they're, ha- they're having some severe economic problems, which um, may or may not, uh, allow them a- any type of uh, serious retaliation against the U.S. for the, the killing of, uh, of Soleimani. Clearly, uh, the most important retaliation that they could take would be uh, to close the Straits of Hormuz, which would probably block something like, let's say, 17 million barrels a day 
of uh, crude through through the straits. I I, I don't think that uh, they they really have the wherewithal to to do that right now. Things would really have to escalate seriously uh, for for the straits to to be closed. Could they attack uh, oil infrastructure? Yeah, I mean they just did it, and uh, they they may try that. Uh, again, but again, whether or not the, the, they have have the uh, the wherewithal to do that right now, particularly with with the regime un, under pressure uh, for the downing of the um, jet, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure where they're going to go with that. I mean, could could there be proxy attacks? Yeah, uh, there certainly could be uh, proxy attacks. But but in terms of, of actual loss of of output or uh, loss of uh, supply. I'm not, I, don't, I don't think we're going to see a, a serious loss of supply, Jim. It's, so, um, but, but you're not saying, I mean, what I hear from what you're saying is you don't, don't sell out of the money calls, right? Don't sell out of them. No, of course no, not. Of course not, yeah. You know, of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, do you think there's a possibility that um, what's going on with Iran, with, um, you know, the protests internally, Lebanon, even uh, even Iraq, the uh, some of the uh, Iranian, uh, uh, what I guess the Shiites are, are also uh, protesting in Iraq, and, and um, do you think that would move them closer to maybe an agreement with uh, Europe and the U.S.? Uh, going forward, it's a it's an election year for Trump. It would be uh, something that well, it's, hard, it's hard to say what he really wants. And um, do you think there's a possibility of a uh, talks and moving towards an agreement, maybe led by uh, uh, French? You mean the, that Macron yeah. proposal? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, there's a chance for that. I'm, I'm not. I don't think you. It's hard to be optimistic that 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 could happen, but there, there's certainly a, a chance and. You know, let's not forget that that's a million barrels a day of uh, Iranian crude that that uh, could come on on the market. Or uh, I, I know the deal was maybe a half million barrels a day uh, to come on right away. But I, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, Jim. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really don't think that's going to happen. But low, low probability. having said that, that that is more that is a downside risk to to the market. You know, right, the, the, because we're, we're, you know, there is that. There certainly is that added supply. Plus, you know, they, they've been building up storage because their production is, is way more than uh, what their uh, exports or internal demand would be for uh, crude. Hence, you know, the exports of refined products. But nevertheless, you know, that the, they're they've got storage. So if there was some kind of agreement, it could come onto the market right away, very quickly. Okay, um, moving, you know, OPEC came out with their oil, uh, monthly oil report, and um, they showed production at 29.44 in December. Now, that's uh, from secondary sources. What Going forward, what, where do you see their production? And let's, let's talk about the uh, call on their oil in that report. In the yeah, EIA as this well. is the, this is yeah. the, yeah, this, this is the, the main thing, right? Uh, you know, the main fundamental for the for the market is uh, you know what they're what the call on OPEC crew, which is derived from what ex- is expected global you know non OPEC supply, yes. um, le- less demand, and yes. then come up with the the one you know one number that you can focus on that can quickly say, all right, are we in surplus? Are we in deficit? Yes, you know, I'm so, it, trying to simplify things, Andy. There's a lot of moving parts in this market. There's a lot of moving parts, <laughs> but let, let's get down to let's distill like the main, you know, yeah. the, the the main number. And uh, as you said, the the OPEC production is um, twenty twenty nine point four four. It looks as though. You know, we, we like to take the um, EIA, uh, the IEA, and uh, OPEC numbers and, and kind of put them together and, and get a, you know, a sense of, uh, a sense of what the, the, the average of the three of them are because they, they tend to be, not, they, they don't tend to be all that close all the time. But it looks as though if you did that, the, the first half of the year, the call on OPEC crude would be something like 28.7 million barrels a day. Just, just take, you know, just taking the average. Right. I think if, so if OPEC's producing 29.4, you 
that then we have a surplus of 0.7. I think it's going to be closer, though. I think the actual call is going to be a little bit higher, and I think OPEC production is going to be a little bit lower. But still, it's a surplus, and and what we're looking at is probably a four to five hundred thousand barrel a day surplus on the market for the for the uh, for the first half of the year. You look at the second half of the year, and again, going through the same analysis, that call goes up to by a million barrels a day to like twenty nine point eight. So if OPEC was producing twenty nine two, you know, then you have a deficit of uh, half a million barrels a day. But as you said, Jim, there's a lot of moving parts on those numbers. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's look at some of those. Um, the, the, uh, we talk to people who model uh, consumption, and many of them say it's basically GDP plus weather. I guess uh, there's been some revisions in, in GDP. I think the EIA is leaving their um, their estimate on change, but I think OPEC may have bumped their, uh, this is demand, world demand for next year, may have bumped it up a little bit. But I see uh, numbers like uh, a million three, a million two, and we get the, um, we get the IEAs tomorrow. Um, you, what do you think of those? You think that those are good numbers? You think they're Yeah, two- I think, uh, I actually think one, two is, is probably right. Um, it looked like 2019 will come in around a million you know, give or take a hundred thousand. We lost a lot of demand on the on the uh, on manufacture and and you know and some weather factors. Gasoline was was disappointing this year, as as was uh, diesel was was pretty dis- was very disappointing. We'll talk about U.S. diesel demand, um, and I guess we'll talk about IMO twenty twenty. But I, I think one one two yeah one two one three yeah. I, th- I think that's uh, possible. Presumably, there's going to be, uh, you know, maybe trade picks up some, you know, with the signing of the of the uh, this phase one deal, maybe. And is that um, is that the, the usual suspects? India, China, rest of world, and then OE- OECD is pretty yeah, much flat. OECD was it was probably down last. You know, maybe even was probably down last year. And uh, China, you know, India sort of had a, didn't have a great year. China had a good year yeah. on uh, petroleum demand. Um, certainly their, their import numbers were just like rip roaring in the, in the fourth quarter. Some of that probably went into storage, but some of that went into their new refinery capacity. They have 800,000 barrels a day of uh, new refinery capacity and that, and that you know, is coming out as um, diesel, you know, that they're, they're diesel monsters. So, you know, that that's sort of soft, the, softened the, the refinery margins in Asia are not, are not good at all. And um, despite the, you know, this, despite the higher demand and, you know, that, that may be a, um, that may be part and parcel of uh, you know, some of the new refinery capacity well, that's, that was going to be one of my questions. Is uh, we're, we're seeing another million barrel of plus plus million of demand. Do we have do we have the refining capacity? And uh, your answer is by all, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a surplus of refinery capacity probably coming up here in the next uh, you know next couple of years. I think the you know Jim. They always talk about the golden age of, of refinery, you know, of refined products. And every few years, there's a golden age. You know, it looks like this this last golden age is uh, you know, coming to an end. Yeah, uh, or if it already uh, has it, because of, you know, margins right now. It's early in the year, but, but margins are, uh, you know, nothing nothing to write home about in in either the U.S. or uh, certainly in uh, certainly in Asia, despite, well, IMO just, just kicked, you know, just kicked off. So the IMO 2020, so we'll see what the effect is. The European margins are, are okay. Not, not as, not bad. So um, I wanted to move back to um, maybe, do you, you want to cover U.S. oil demand or you want to talk about non-OPEC supply first? Well, now? let's talk about, you know, since we're going on, uh, since we're still talking about these balances. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about non-OPEC supply because it, it's going to be a um, big story. It, it already is a big story as we head out of the fourth quarter and into the first half of uh, 2020. 
you know, we're, we're seeing, we've already seen big gains in, uh, in Brazil, thanks to the, the pre-salt is finally coming in, you know, and, and uh, the, the, so we're going to see a, probably a five to 600,000 barrel a day growth. We've already seen it and it's, uh, we'll see some more as we head into 2020. Norway is going to have a, uh, a good year on, uh, on production with the startup already the startup of their um, Johan Sverup field and uh, Guyana is going to have a really big year. You know, they're, they're going to go from zero to 120,000 barrels a day uh, of uh, offshore production this year, last year, zero. Uh, and they're saying that they think by 2025, they could be producing 750,000 barrels a day. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll see. Well, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, we'll see. How do you become a citizen? We're ready, right? Be, be honest. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Be gonna, honest about to be like Alaska. Yeah. If they don't mismanage their, yeah. uh, you know, their natural resources. Well, we'll, we'll see. But nevertheless, you know, it's part of a, a, gro- a growing pattern. And, and then uh, there's North America, um, the, the, U.S., you know, we're, we're looking to grow the, the EIA just increased, surprisingly increased their view for, uh, for 2020 to, I think, 13.3 million barrels a day from like 13.2 million barrels a day. But significantly, you know, that they're, they're we're, we're at 13 now. Yeah, the weekly number that came out this morning showed uh, production at thirteen zero. Now those are the weeklies; they get revised, but still, that's this. That's to me that was just. Uh, I mean, we were at twelve nine, but I'm just saying thirteen is. Who would have thunk it? I know. It's still, I know. It's still an amazing story. Um, it still is an amazing story, but you, you have to. You, th- those gains we really saw. Uh, I'm looking at the monthly productions right now. Production of U.S. crude. Yeah. So in May we were at twelve point one three, okay, and de- so December we're at twelve point nine. So we really saw a huge boom in the second half of uh, 2019 on, on U.S. production. We're not going to see that, I don't think, in uh, in 2020. But that that's that's uh, like a, a pipeline opened up or something, right? <laughs> yeah, it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the the Permian just went you know, it was out of control in the, in the second half of, uh, of 2019. So, you know, we'll see there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different views on, uh, on where U S production is going to come in and, uh, in 2020, looking at our world, Jim, you know, you'd have to believe that on that rally in, uh, you know, in, into December and, and early January, there was a lot of hedge activity for yes. second half 2020 and into and Cal 2021. Yes. So yeah. maybe that brings, maybe that brings extra barrels out. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to say. Um, the, the, um, you're, you're also dealing with the comparisons because like you said, we're, we're expecting the EIA is looking for what 13, three for the whole year. Right. And we're at 13 even now. So you could say, well, that's not a huge increase from where we are now, but, if you do the year-to-year comparisons, because we Big. have that, it's it's so yeah, it's like a it's like over a million, right? Right, but you but in a way that's not the you know I don't think you can look at it that way. No, no, right. The, you say oh we're up a million, but we already yeah. hit you know we already yes. had a big yes big it's boom, a, so yes. we're not up that much. But you know we'll see. I I actually looked, I went back and looked at what they were saying last January, mm-hmm. the EIA. They they totally missed it. I mean, they they were they were looking for December production to be like twelve three or twelve four. Yeah, I think it was a number, and it came in at you know it came in at like twelve at twelve nine. So, you know, you you throw some engineers at an issue and they figure stuff out. <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, well, they did. I remember. You know, they did. In fairness to them, you know that they, they did into the first and second quarter begin to make some serious revisions right on, uh, on their look for uh yeah for q19 plus you know it's uh these these are these are hard things to forecast 
especially when it, when we're talking about the future. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you got that right. Yeah. But let's talk about just getting into non-OPEC. So non-OPEC production is supposed to grow, could grow as much as two and a half million barrels a day this year. Right. And, and you know, this year is not really U.S. driven. Right. Uh, it's driven by, you know, it's going to be oh, driven by Brazil and the, what, we, what we had mentioned and also Russia. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's, do you think this non-OPEC production puts more pressure on this uh, OPEC pack? Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, you know, they had to, they, they had to sharpen their pencils at the last meeting and uh, come up with some, some additional cuts. So um, yeah, it, it definitely puts a lot, puts a lot of pressure on them. And, and that I think leads us squarely to, you know, what, what they're, what they're going to do, you know, so, yeah, what, what, are they, what to do about it. Right. And squarely to the Russians because, you know, the, this, this deal, the OPEC deal is through first quarter. We heard yesterday, I mean, there was some talk about them not meeting in March, which I think would be smart not to meet in March because the, 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 I think the Saudis and Russians are, uh, you know, have some different views. And, um, you know, the Russians, want to, they, they want out. They want to start increasing production. They already got a pass on condensates, and they'll, they'll be producing record condensates as we head into the second half of the, the year. And they want to increase crude production, too. Mm-hmm. You know, they probably have another few hundred thousand barrels a day that they can crank out, maybe as much as 400 a day. So, you know, as, they, as we head into June, they're going to look at this call on OPEC crude and as you mentioned, Jim, their own, their own agency, OPEC, has them at 30, at 30 million barrels a day calling OPEC crude for the second half of the year. Right. So here they are at 29.2, and they say, okay, the call's going to be 30 million barrels a day. What are uh, we going to do? It's coming from us. It's going to come from us. Gonna, yeah, we're going to get it. Yeah. We're good, we, so that we're going to have to increase production. Yeah. And then the deal ends, and then the Russians increase production. Right. And, you know, is it a free-for-all? Is it a managed increase? You've got, you've got the neutral zone coming on. So, you know, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> Not to mention in the background, and I know you hate this, so you, get, you, you have the EVs, you know, they, they're, they're – I'm not, I don't think they're at a critical mass, but the, the growth is impressive. And um, electric vehicles um, might start, I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure it's in the back of their minds that, you know, in the long run, fossil fuels, oil demand is going to flatten out, you know, maybe go down. And in the meantime, we've got all this non-OPEC stuff keeping us from producing our oil now. It's going to be worth less as we go f- in. Right. Go f- forward. I would think. I was. What I, my bottom line is, I'm thinking there's more pressure for them to produce more earlier than later. You, yeah, you may be right. What they do have going for them, they have a few things going for them. One is depletion. I mean, that's a great thing because uh, for them at least, because you know we, we lose uh, three to four percent of um, of production every of crude production every year on uh on depletion so that that that'll help them the other thing is uh, there aren't that many new offshore projects on the on the boards right now i mean guiana yeah i mean they're they're, they're talking a big game against that is that it, it, the costs are lower and you can probably get you know you can move quicker from the mm-hmm. planning board to the project but you know what are those What's happening on those planning boards? Because it isn't only OPEC looking at um, alternative, you know, alternatives and, and EVs and uh, renewables. You know, the majors, they're not, their heads aren't in the sand. And, they, and they've no, got not. a, you know, and they're, 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 the whole um, ESG movement now is, is something that's going to be, that's pressuring these, uh, right. you know, so, some of the majors. So um, less capital available, maybe. Less, right, less capital available. If, and imagine if there's a ban on plastic. Oh boy. 
that would be bad because plastic has been, you know, that, that, the, the, um, you know, the, the HGLs have been the, the one leading, have really been a great demand leader, you know, along with diesel, not last year. Speaking of diesel. Yes. Let, right. Let's just move on to this. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Let, let's move on to uh, the EIA numbers, which were unbelievably bearish. This weekly number. Uh, just Today, a- today's week, there's a, the um, monthly report came out yesterday, and then the weeklies came out, came out this morning. So right. You t- so you're and- talking about the, go ahead. Yeah, so we've seen gasoline stocks build 16 million in two weeks. This still had built 11 million, and total stocks building 30 million. Day supply were were ahead of everything except crude didn't crude didn't build because of the exports. So those numbers are were ugly. I mean, just mm. the the two week numbers are were really ugly. Some of that is end of year tax nonsense, but it's not it's not a great way to be heading into uh, into January. Now, the good news is that February, the good news for products is that February we go into turnaround, so maybe things will tighten up on, on the product side. The distillates, the, the weather has been, the, the, you know, we haven't really had any, any serious no. cold weather here. No. Uh, so that's not helping. And gasoline demand has basically plateaued. So uh, we, we've got like three years in a row at nine three, and I don't, I don't see a big growth on, uh, on gasoline, as you mentioned. You, you know, EVs are going to start having a, an effect, maybe not this year or next year, but you know, as we move into mid-decade, they're going to have a big, you know, start having a big effect. Yeah, there's also the uh, lifestyle changes. I mean, when I was my kids' age, I was driving a lot more than they do, and they don't even I have two kids. They don't own they don't own cars. So there's this, and I don't drive as much as I used to. So there's a whole lifestyle change, at least in the U.S., right? Right. And but people are working from home. The people are working work from, from home. home. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the fleet is certainly getting more, more efficient as uh, some of the older cars are retired. But uh, still, um, yeah. we heard this number last night, and it's a number that I think I used in last, in last month's podcast. There are 1.2 billion internal combustion engines on the road, and there's right. only 7 million electric vehicles on the road. So, mm. you know, it's going to take a decade at least to retire those, those internal combustion engines, maybe, yeah. maybe more. Yeah. And in fact, we're not going to because the projections are by 2030, there's going to be 2 billion internal combustion engines on the road and, and still only hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles. So there's a long way to go. Still, yeah, that's right. Just to, I just want to back off. Uh, you mentioned the warm weather. Um, our old friend, the uh, March-April natural gas uh, spread has gone backward dated. And that's been, um, I guess... You know, there's a lot of widow makers around, you know, trades that, uh, you know, are, are uh, uh, sort of uh, behave in a normal way until they don't. And they, and they take a lot of lives in terms of uh, traders uh, blowing out. And um, I want to, if I had to call a widow maker in your world, it would be the heat to gas spread. <laughs> right. So, and is it, and that thing has gone, like, you, you know, you say, well, you never sell heating oil in the wintertime. And you never sell gasoline during the the gas season, um, but even that is probably that's gone by the boards. I think. Yeah, that's blowing out people on both sides as yeah. well. Yeah, and I and in my world, the widow maker would be selling teeny options, like selling deep out of the money options, uh, because uh, you know the the line we used to hear is, uh, "I don't know where the market's going, but I know where it's not going," and so they would sell those calls or those puts in a huge way and then, and then blow up. So, so I just want, I just wanted to mention the uh, March, April natural gas spread has gone a uh, little, little, uh, sorry, did I say backward aided? Yeah, I think it's I, contango. I, I meant contango. I meant yeah. contango. Yeah. It's always backward aided except when it's not. And, and just in a little bit, but it's just, uh, it's, it's an amazing spread. If you go back and look at the history of that thing. 
Uh, well, Jim, I don't think you wanted to be short the, uh, even though you felt pretty good about being short the March 65 calls in WTI. Yeah. Well, when it spiked to 65, 65 uh, yeah. overnight, that was. Overnight, yeah. Yeah, yeah that exactly. wasn't a good feeling. Yes, no, especially, yes, that's right. Um, can we can we talk about the crude curve for a minute, Andy? We, we have the uh, first, you know, we, we have this idea that we're going to have uh, lots of barrels or, or plentiful barrels in the first half. And maybe as we get through the third quarter, it starts to tighten up. And um, we, I, I mentioned this because we saw yesterday uh, a bunch of um, spread option calls trade. So these uh, July through Dece, uh, these would be one month spread. So July, Augie, Augie, Sep, Sep, Ock, et cetera, $1 calls traded and uh, some 150 calls traded. And I was just wondering if you thought, um, I, if I look out, say the June D spread looks like it's around 40 cents a month uh, backwardation on that. And, um, it, you know, is that, what do you think about that play? Uh, do you think that the situation in the second half of the year could get tight enough that we see dollar backwardation? Yeah, it's, it's, always, it's always possible. I, inventories are going to build in February for sure because of the, you know, because of, um, turnarounds, and turnarounds. Yeah. Uh, they're probably, I have them building in March, April and May and the EIA has them building uh, way more than what I have. I mean, they, they have them building from, we're currently at 429 and they have them up. They have inventories going up to 477 in May. I'm, I'm like 20 to 30 million below that but nevertheless a, a build uh and then second half yeah we you know we, we a lot of that'll depend on where the production curve you know where production comes in where the runs are eia has runs like way above last year and they're completely wrong you know that's going to be there's no way we're going to be a million barrels a day on, on crude runs above above last year i think they're thinking that we're supplying the whole world on uh you know, for, for, uh, IMO 2020, that's, you know, we're not. Yeah. Um, so, but they're, they're all, their data is, they're, they're also wrong on net net exports, but it doesn't really, you know, they've got us drawing in second half. The question, can it get a dollar? I think it's going to get, it, 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 the SPAC gradations come off pretty hard. It has. You know, like the D's red D's and the June D's, it's come off hard. I think it come, could come off a little bit more. And a dollar a month. I think that's going to be tough, Jim. Yeah, yeah I, th I think they're looking at it as like deep out of the money call to buy. So, yeah, I think it's, a, you know, somewhat of a long shot, but a possibility. Is yeah. That, you know, uh, if, I'm, if I'm buying those anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else do we need to cover, Andy? Well, I think we got to get to price and then we'll... Oh, we'll right. uh, it sounds to me like you're look. I mean, there's a consensus maybe uh, forming that we this year we stay around sixty five dollars Brent and maybe you know six dollars under that for WTI. Is that yeah, right? I, th I think that's sixty to sixty five Brent and you know maybe fifty five to sixty w WTI. Um, it, lo it looks like there could be a little more downside here. We did see on that spike uh, uh, for, the, for the technicians among us. And I, I think I sent you a message. Did. Jim, I think that was the mother of all key reversals. Yeah. And, you know, it does look to me like in, in the near term here, we're going to, we're going to weaken, so weaken further. Are we going to, you know, 55 is, a, is an important level. Can we break that? Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll see how, you know, we'll, we'll see what sentiment is. There's a lot of length and the, the market has really built up a lot of length. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're, we're spitting some of that, some of that out right now. Yeah. But, that's, that's yeah. the, the most, uh, the strike with the most open interest is the June, June 55 put 28,000. So it looks like, uh, I'm guessing a lot of that's hedging people, yeah. have, you know, you, you see that through the curve. The 55 and 45 puts are a little higher than the rest, and um, but still, not, not there's no there's no huge open interest strike. It's it's all spread out. So really, I mentioned the volume was down 30 percent. It's hard to find out 
you know, where the market is lining up in terms of uh, how they're trading this thing. But it looks like, as we, as we talked about, the hedgers are, are buying those puts. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And the, and the December uh, price is $55 now. So that's a, you, I guess you can, you can make a little bit of money on that. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think the hedging activity is, as the market, you know, is that like the Cal 21 got into, you know, 55. I, th- I think that definitely picked up a lot of, a lot of interest. Yeah. But, you know, so, so, so I think, I think it's possible we could see low fifties, maybe, maybe even press 50, maybe, you know, depending on where, where, uh, where sentiment is, where overall macro sentiment is, you know, that, that may prevent us from really getting much below 50. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it sounds to me like you're saying 55, 60 is, is most likely, likely with a, uh, f- if, if it's going to blow out one side or the other, it's, it probably goes lower. So, yeah, I think there's more downside risks. More downside than upside. Than, than upside here. Yeah. And so so for me, if I'm an option guy, I'm thinking I want to be selling options, but it's oil. But, it's oil. Right, right. <laughs> well, well, we talked about the geopolitical exactly. problems, you know, yeah. that, that could be any, anything. Yeah, yeah that could be uh, anywhere in, uh, you know, in Africa, South America. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's the infrastructure issues that seem to plague North America and Europe. So, um, yeah. yeah. And e- even if you're awake when that event happens, you you still can't do anything because the market disappears. <laughs> it's, it's liquid until it isn't. Right. Until yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what else? Any, any, uh, any other comments, Andy? Uh, check us out on uh, Commodity Research Group dot com what else i think we i think we've covered everything okay. not everything no of course we, not uh, uh, yeah it's impossible yeah. to cover everything in a half hour but um yeah you know i think i think we went through a lot of the the bold face issues and some of the not bold face issues but um as usual it looks it looks like it's going to be a uh you know it's already been an interesting year look what happened i can't believe we just came out of the gate and it's yeah we came out of the gate stuff's and, happening uh, yeah. Yeah. Markets had uh, almost the ten dollar range. So uh yeah. It should, yeah you, it should be. you can't even shut down for the holidays anymore, you know. It's like <laughs> it's no. always, there's something going on up. Right. Always. So anyway, okay, Andy. Um we'll pick it up next month. We uh we look for us we try to do this around um you know, post uh the uh EIA's um release of their monthly oil report uh we we, that's what we shoot for we don't always make it but uh we'll be around next month as well